Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Deadhead Cannabis Show. Uh, This is Larry Mishkin welcoming you to another episode of our podcast. My normal co-host, Jim Marty, is out today uh, celebrating Thanksgiving with family. So a shout out to Jim. Hope you have a great Thanksgiving and uh, you've worked a little cannabis into the the meal with some Grateful Dead music in the background, and we'll hear all about it next week. So I will miss Jim today, but I am... uh, uh, joined, I can happily say, uh, by Rob Hunt. Rob is a multi-appearance guest on our show and uh, was kind enough to step in on rather short notice to help us out and fill in for Jim today. Rob, how are you? I'm great, Larry. Thanks. How you doing? I'm doing just fine. And as I'm sitting here in what's not so lovely this time of year, Illinois, uh, we're cold, we're rainy, and not at all Thanksgiving weather. Uh, what's it like where you are? Uh, well, Southern California is Southern California, so 70 degrees and sunny, and I'll probably go for a mountain bike ride or a hike after uh, after this podcast and get out and try to enjoy a little bit of the weather before it gets too cold or dark. Good for you out there. Very nice. Um, I'm glad you could join us today. We will, of course, uh, get to some Grateful Dead in a moment because it's not worthwhile having Rob Hunt on the show if we don't talk Grateful Dead uh, in excess. However, um, we're going to start with a little bit of marijuana talk. Uh, And I'm going to give everyone a quick update on what's going on in Illinois. We've been following the scene here for a while. Uh, It's been generally frustrating and it's gotten worse. And uh, an announcement just came out yesterday on the uh, dispensary level uh, that the state of Illinois is no longer going to be negotiating with any of the parties and it's going to step back and it's going to let the court process play itself out. And the estimate is that with the parties that are currently involved and the claims that are swirling back and forth, Even with expedited work, we're probably looking at nothing earlier than April before we get some sort of a judicial ruling. Um, And while we'd all like to think that that would then trigger the uh, process to go forward and finalize who gets the licenses, all of us lawyers know that the real money is made on appeal. And so I have no confidence that the litigation coming to a close will actually be the end. I should say the trial work will be the end of the uh, end of the litigation. So we'll see. But uh, people who are expecting to find out on April 1st of 2020, whether or not uh, all the time and money they put into their applications had paid off for them are now being told that it'll be at least uh, one year from that date. If we're lucky before they will find out anything and uh, they may not even know by then to compound the problem. Uh, the state seems to be signaling that it will delay announcements of the craft grow and processing licenses until after it announces the dispensary licenses, uh, because since they were all scored on the same system with the same scoring company, KPMG, uh, they want to see what the court has to say about it on the dispensary level uh, before they are convinced as to whether or not uh, they're clear on the craft, grow, and processing level. However, there is pending litigation from the newly formed Craft Growers Association uh, in federal court trying to get an order entered to compel the state to announce the winners of the craft grow uh, and not to go forward. Um, and actually, uh, Rob, this is a topic that you and I have discussed before, and and you know it might be interesting to talk about here for a minute because uh, I happen to have clients on both sides of this divide, especially on the dispensary level, uh, where I have one who qualified for the uh, for the tiebreaker with a perfect score, and a few others who didn't. And quite frankly. Um, I think they should have had perfect scores, too. Uh, So I understand their frustration um, and I understand uh, their desire to get behind litigation uh, that's going to hopefully give them a chance to still be part of the game. You know, the problem, of course, is is that it delays the rollout of this next phase of the Illinois program uh, out for such a long time. Uh, that I wonder, you know, if the real losers aren't, you know, the citizens of Illinois and the people who had come to this state to make use of the program. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I don't think there's any doubt about that at all. When you think about the uh, the implications of keeping an illicit market alive, the longer litigation happens, you know, one of two things happens as a result. One, the the companies that actually have licenses already just become infinitely stronger during that period, and the illicit market is just artificially kept alive. 
And so as I've watched states that have tried to say we're going to take a very nuanced and measured approach to how we open up um, legalization in our state, what they fail to realize is that, you know, by doing so and not allowing free market capitalism just to kind of work its way through the, the way a lot of the West Coast states have, um, there's all sorts of other issues that, that happen. And so I've always joked about it with potential clients and with other people that are looking at, you know, the, the application process. And they say, OK, once a law is passed, you know, what's the next you know, part of the, uh, the process? And I say, well, the state's got to figure out the rulemaking. Then at that point, they open up the RFP process to start taking documents in for the applications. Then it's you know, a period of time to accept the applications and then a period of time to grade them. And then comes two years of litigation. And they always look at me cross-eyed when I say that. And uh, I, look, I'm not trying to be cynical. If you're dealing with a, a very contested, limited license state like in Illinois or in New York or, or uh, you know, a lot of the other East Coast states, expect that litigation is part of this process because anyone that's you know dropped half a million dollars into an application that doesn't receive one and was very close to receiving one is going to have a perception of being wronged in the process. And all that does is uh, convince them that they need to file suit and slow down, slow down the process. Again, th- to your point, it's the citizens and, and those that want to access the Canvas program that end up losing. Um, and if they just you know made it more accessible, like let's say Maryland, for instance, or Nevada, where they you know put out enough uh, licenses out there, then most people that want one that were qualified were able to get one. It's only in the states where it's so few that you can't. Right. You're right. Oklahoma, for instance, I have a couple of clients who have expressed some interest in the Oklahoma market where everybody gets in. And what, one of the things I was really kind of surprised to see was that the uh, commercial price in Oklahoma has not dropped as precipitously as I thought it might, given the number of dispensaries and producers that are out there. You know, but it seems like they've been able to maintain at least a reasonable price out there. And, you know, that would certainly weigh heavy in favor of, you know, that model that you're talking about, which is, and that's what they do here for hemp in Illinois. It's very interesting, right? Anyone who wants a hemp license, you can go online, you can get one in about 20 minutes, as long as you have a piece of property and you don't have a disqualifying uh, conviction in your background, you're in, Um, you know, and then you want to go start growing hemp or processing hemp, have at it. And it seems to me that that would also be the best way, because if you have people who are really going to throw a lot of money into it, great. Let's have a couple of big high rollers in the industry. You'll probably get a few who will come in on the lower level. And, you know, somewhere along the way, it'll balance itself out. And really, you're right. It is free market capitalism at that point. But more importantly, what it does is it eliminates all of this litigation. And as a guy who made his living doing litigation for 30 years, you know, I have to say that, you know, the lesson I've learned is that nobody comes out of litigation happy. It takes forever. Uh, you know, the attorneys get paid money, but the clients aren't happy and bitch at them. The attorneys bitch about the judges. The judges don't care. And, you know, it, it's never a positive experience for anyone. And, it, it you know, while I, I empathize with all of those people, uh, especially those here in Illinois, because I think some of their arguments are legit. I think there were some problems with the scoring and the grading. But, you know, the solution that's being proposed is basically just to let everybody in. And if you let everybody into the tiebreaker, then my argument is, why did we have to do all of this other work? Why didn't we just have a tiebreaker? Here's my name. Put me in the tiebreaker. You know, instead of having people spend all of this money to try to create a competitive application that apparently now it becomes irrelevant. Yeah, no, it's, it's certainly a problem. And you'd think that when you look at the states that have had hyper successful programs, that the other states would follow suit. And Colorado being a prime example of a group that really came out of the gate, thought about this thing, did it right. They got caught flat footed when they first um, you know, passed the laws back in 2008. But by 2011 or so, they'd gotten it largely correct. And as you went into adult use, they got it correct again. And it was we're not going to restrict the, uh, the ability of people to open. But once you open, then you better be a good operator. If you're not a good operator, then the guy next door is probably going to clean your clock. And if he does, you're probably out of business. So you know, it, it was incumbent upon the people that opened the, uh, the stores or opened their cultivations to be good performers. And if they knew how to run a business, then they're going to be just fine. If you look at the number of you know uh, dispensaries in Colorado back in 2000, uh, call it 10 or 11, there's only half as many today. And that's because you know the, the, the cream rose to the top. And it's very, very simple that way. Uh, ultimately, you're going to have equilibrium in a market. And, uh, and that's going to happen in any market. Anytime you've got an underserviced market, the only thing you're doing is keeping an illicit market alive. And the only other thing you're doing is creating behemoths of, of businesses, which is what the intention was, you know, initially to not create, which is, you know, we don't we don't want, you know, big business cannabis. We want to make sure that this is something that initially was, you know, for for medical patients and then ultimately for adult use was going to be something that was accessible to, to everyone. And I don't think anyone wanted to create the um, the, you know, the, the Budweiser's or the um, Diageo's of the world uh, in the cannabis industry. 
And that's, you know, that's, that's what we're looking at. Yeah. That's what's happening here in Illinois, for instance, you know, we had a couple, and I give these guys credit. I mean, they're great businessmen. They came out of the box and starting in a state like Illinois with a very restricted medical program that was going nowhere. They created these huge multi-state operations and Cresco and GTI and revolution and, you know, uh, uh, um, Pharmacan and a few of these have really, uh, you know, come onto the national scene in a big way and done a really good job for themselves. But one of the things that they are doing is, you know, I predict it's just a matter of time before they pretty much own the Illinois market. And, you know, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I guess kind of remains to be seen. Um, but I really like the idea of there being a, uh, a competitive market that allows, you know, for lack of a better way of saying it, the mom and pop shop in, you know, and give people who really are, you know, true cannabis fans an opportunity, you know, to participate in the market. Yeah. And, and look, I think we're both smart enough to realize that ultimately there's going to be a consolidation across the entire market and, you know, it's going to happen post federal legalization. But in the meantime, uh, you know, it should allow, you know, some groups to, uh, to come out. And I always look at telecom in the nineties where everyone was opening, you know, sort of like cell phone towers before the consolidation hit and you ended up with your Verizons and T-Mobiles and, and a couple other winners. But initially there was, you know, thousands and thousands of cell operators that uh, that then watched consolidation. And there's a lot of people in that process that did very well for themselves by uh, by by entering that market and being good at it. And, you know, to your point in Illinois, if you look at the ruling that came down from the appellate court in New Jersey yesterday, you know, it's the first time in, in a while we've gotten some uh, movement in New Jersey, which was, you know, the, the results for the most recent wave of medical applications came out, you know, months ago and then immediately entered a stage of litigation. And the appellate court yesterday came out and said, you know, there isn't enough reason to uh, to stop some of the other applicants that were denied licenses from being denied. So, you know, what's going to happen? We're not sure, but it's certainly going to open up the market a little bit. But if you look at this period of latency where nothing has happened between the time that they should have announced the winners and the time that these guys should have been able to, to open their, their doors. Since then, we've watched uh, adult use legalization in, in New Jersey pass, which means that the next round of applications for adult use is going to start relatively soon. So all these people that felt wronged by the process and felt like it wasn't fair that they lost, had they just bided their time and waited until the inevitability of, of legalization under Governor Murphy, they would have gotten another bite at this apple anyway. And, and quite honestly, at a more lucrative style uh, license, being an adult use license rather than a medical license. So really, where is the perceived harm? You know, where, where, is, uh, where is it they couldn't have waited for six months instead of holding the entire industry back in favor of waiting it out until the next wave um, opened up? And that's, you know, it, hopefully, you know, states like New York and Pennsylvania, as they go into their process, and they will hopefully very soon, are going to look at what happened in New Jersey and say, OK, we, we need to make this um, a, a bit less restrictive than it has been in favor of having more applicants and more winners and more licenses. So that we're just not mired in litigation for the foreseeable future. Well, I think that's 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 great. And you're absolutely right about that. And, you know, what I what I imagine and, and I, you know, I don't mean this in a in a negative way, but it's kind of hard to imagine, avoid is, you know, these big players here in Illinois, you know, kind of, you know, secretly toasting themselves with champagne because yeah. by doing little or nothing, um, you know, their monopoly on the market is going to extend into the foreseeable future. And I mean, and the Illinois market is, is out of control right now. It, 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 you know, each month we beat the previous month in terms of sales and products sold and everything. And, you know, and, and good for these guys, you know, they, they carried the, the medical market and, and I understand but I, I think that ultimately you said this also, how much more difficult is it for a craft grow to come on the scene, you know, to already compete against a full scale grow, right? There, you can come on, you can grow marijuana commercially in the state, but only on 5,000 square feet. And you have to compete against Cresco and GTI who are growing on 100,000 square feet per facility. And they have multiple facilities. But now, in, you know, in the adult use market, by the time any of these other craft growers finally find out if they have licenses, you know, you have branding, you have people who have pretty much decided, I like Verano, I like Cresco, I like, uh, you know, Arise, any of these, and, and they're all, you know, they're all good in their own way. But how do you, how does, how does a late coming craft grow that's limited in what it can do, hope to compete in a market after there's been so much lag time that the medical people have really, you know, sunk their, their roots into it? No, absolutely. We'll see. It's, uh, you know, I, I would like everyone who would like to have a license to get one. I think that, you know, the way you discuss it is definitely the way to go. And hopefully um, we'll find out. Another thing that you and I had looked at talking about today, and 
Uh, ultimately, I think we've come to the conclusion that it might be premature is now that it looks at least like we have a final result and that Joe Biden is going to be our next president. And so for a lot of people in our industry, it's not too early to start wondering what impact that's going to have on the industry. And uh, I think, as you pointed out, you know, while he's starting to name some of his cabinet, uh, we still need to see who the rest of those people are going to be. Uh, we need to have an opportunity to go and explore what their positions are on this. I guess I would say that I feel better about its chances. Uh, but given the fact that a guy like Obama wasn't willing to touch it, I don't necessarily see it as a slam dunk with this administration. I think that's right. Uh, you certainly saw Kamala Harris in her vice presidential debate uh, say that, you know, decriminalization is certainly on the table. I think that there's you know going to be um, an expansion of the industry. But, you know, there has been, you know, even through the Trump uh, administration, quite honestly, even through uh, through George W. You know, before that. So it's not to say that Republicans being, um, you know, running the government from the executive branch are going to slow this thing down. The question is just when do we get to, you know, full tilt uh, federal legalization? And I don't think that um, that Biden or Harris necessarily will will make that move. And certainly I don't think it'll be the first thing that they touch. But what I will say is that uh, we're going to know a lot more when we see who Biden names as attorney general. And I can say with definitive certainty that that attorney general will certainly be more permissive than either Jeff Sessions or Bill Barr. Um, you know, whether or not there is a, as relaxed as Eric Holder or um, or uh, Loretta Lynch, uh, hard to say, but I would expect you're going to see a pretty permissive um, attorney general that when it comes to drug policy. The big question is what happens in Georgia on January 5th. I was just going to say, right? Yeah, it's, it, at this point, it's really hard to tell. I mean, you're seeing a lot of uh, people on the right that are saying they want to boycott this election because, you know, they feel the election results weren't trustworthy for the presidential election. At the same time, I think there's going to be a lot of Dems that feel like they just pulled out every stop they could to try to win uh, in the presidential race and they barely squeak by. You know, Georgia is traditionally a very red state. It's, it's looking pretty purple right now. But can they motivate, you know, and, and mobilize enough people to come back out and vote again for uh, for the Senate contest? Yeah, if you were to say handicap it, I'd say Mitch McConnell stays in power going into this next session. And if he does, then then I think that most bills that are uh, canvas related bills are still dead on arrival. If they end up either on Lindsey Graham's desk or on Mike Crapo's desk or you know whoever it is that takes over uh, judiciary or banking. It's, I think it's going to be a slog, especially if the uh, the whole goal of a, of a McConnell-led Senate is to prevent any legislation from moving forward under a Biden presidency. Well, that's exactly right. And I think that that's where people tend to lose sight of this is when we talk about what can the administration do, the administration can only do what it can get done in Congress. And it's, and while it's wonderful, to, uh, you know, if you're uh, a liberal and, and so inclined to have Joe Biden in the White House, uh, but as we saw under the Obama presidency, uh, you know, for almost three quarters of his term, uh, when you have a... Uh, uh, a Senate that's opposed to you from the other party, uh, it's already difficult enough. And then you add in a guy like uh, Mitch McConnell, who, you know, has decided that, you know, that gives him, and I guess at some level it does, but, you know, really to kind of abuse that power and be very inclined not to pass measures along. And the reason why I think that's important is, you know, we always talk about, uh, Jim and I like to talk about all the time the fact that marijuana is one of those great subjects that's bipartisan and that, you know, Republicans and conservatives like to get high as much as liberals and Democrats. And, you know, we, we see wide bipartisan support around the country. That was reflected in all the marijuana measures that all passed by by huge amounts. And, and that's a good thing. And and so people might say, well, you know, but is, is Loeffler any more pro or anti marijuana? But it's not really about their personal views. It's about whether or not Mitch McConnell remains head of the Senate. And if he does, then he is the gatekeeper. And I, you know, that, that would not give me great confidence. Well, we know the, 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 what is it? The, the state bill or uh, has been up there and the, the fair banking bill have both been passed by the, with heavy bipartisan support in the house. And they've languished uh, on McConnell's desk. Well, hasn't even gotten to his desk. They've languished in committee. In committee. And right. So, you know, if, if it can't uh, even get out of committee, if you don't get a committee vote, then, uh, then, then McConnell doesn't have to do anything. He can say, oh, you know, he can punt and say it never reached my desk, so it wasn't for me to opine. Right. So, I mean, there's three different layers where, you know, this thing can be shut down. And it's the, the committee, then it's you know, the McConnell introducing it to the Senate floor, and then ultimately it's the president's desk. Right. I think that anything that reaches the president's desk under a Biden administration, if it's been passed in the House and the Senate, will get a signature. Yes, I agree with that. I just don't think you have any chance of uh, of reaching um, Biden's desk. 
if McConnell takes the approach that he's taken, you know, not just uh, during Obama's administration, but even during Trump's administration since the House flipped, where he said, you know, I'm I'm the Grim Reaper and I'm where bills go to die. And so uh, I'd expect that you're going to see any democratically sponsored bill that comes out of a very divided House at this point. Uh, get to McConnell's desk and have him say, well, there isn't really a true mandate here. It's too close in the House. Uh, and at this point, you know, I'm not going to encourage anything being signed that's not, um, you know, fully bipartisan supported, which would come with a great deal of concessions on the Republican side. And I, I don't think they're in the mood to make concessions at this point. No, nope, I think you're right. So, OK, well, this is a uh, an interesting topic. And I suppose until we get the answers to some of our other questions, uh, which way Georgia goes, uh, who the attorney general is, that it's uh, – um, you know, somewhat academic at this point, but uh, it, 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 there are a lot of interesting factors at, with this. And I would certainly suggest for those of you that are uh, big fans or supporters of the cannabis industry, uh, it, that that would help motivate you to uh, contribute to the Georgia campaigns uh, and see if we can't get a Democratic controlled Senate, if for no other reason uh, to kind of open the spigot, if you will, on some of this uh, marijuana legislation that even before we take it off of schedule one, uh, will still help the industry and, and and provide for it in some really good ways. Yeah, I think that's a great way to wrap it up, Larry, is that people need to understand that if you really want you know federal legalization or federal uh, change to progress, this vote in Georgia uh, for cannabis is monumental and that people really need to think about the implications of having a, uh, a Senate that can pass things and can get things out of committee and get them to the president's desk. If you really want to see cannabis legislation move forward, if you're out there in Georgia and you're listening to this, Please do mobilize because it, it makes a huge difference. You know, this this vote is the difference between the States Act and the Safe Banking Act passing or, you know, never even getting a chance to uh, to see a vote. OK, so with that, um, let's turn over to uh, a topic that hopefully uh, all of our listeners can agree upon, uh, and that is the Grateful Dead. And um, given that you and I are sitting here taping this, uh, I know it won't be heard uh, for a few days from now, but we're actually taping it the day before Thanksgiving. Um, and it got me thinking, and I'd pass this thought along to you. You know, we, we have the Grateful Dead playing shows on the 4th of July. We have the Grateful Dead playing shows on New Year's Eve. We have the Grateful Dead playing shows on the summer solstice and the spring solstice and on the Chinese new year and uh, you know, any, any, any good excuse they can ever find to have a concert. They always seem to find one. Um, and it got me thinking about Thanksgiving. And I was really surprised when I did a very quick Google search to find that in all the years, they only played one show uh, on Thanksgiving in 1978. Um, and on the one hand, I find that kind of strange, but on the other hand, maybe not, you know, they like to be home with their families too. Yeah, you know, I thought about it, and you're right. I mean, I, I think of all the holidays I've actually seen the Dead play on, and a lot of the ones you mentioned, I've, I've seen shows, whether it's July 4th, Chinese New Year, Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras, right. But but Thanksgiving is is one that, you know, I, I was thinking, I'm surprised they haven't played more, but then I thought about what Thanksgiving means and, and kind of like the, the family nature of Thanksgiving and how many people really do spend the, the entire day with their families. And I always thought that, you know, the biggest night uh, traditionally for bar sales is the night after Thanksgiving. Right. So you think that would be a, you know, a night that the dead would definitely play a lot. So, you know, I'm curious to know whether the only reason that they never did it again is because ticket sales were low that night or, uh, or they just decided, you know, let's just stick around California and, and hang out with our families rather than being on the road. But having, having said that, the year they played was a pretty hot show. Right. So we should, uh, we should look at it. There aren't too many times where you get a shakedown street after space or get a, a dancing into Terrapin before uh, drums. Well, I, yeah, right. You know, it's so, you know, maybe that's it, you know, because as you read through a set list like this, I mean, Thanksgiving isn't necessarily a holiday that lends itself, you know, to – to a whole, you know, big number of songs that they might play. But as you look through the list, there's nothing that that really jumps off the page and screams the holiday at you, except for the fact that, you know, you're right. They do have some interesting song placement in this show. Uh, you know, I love the fact that they're playing Samson and Delilah and it's not a Sunday night. I wonder what Bobby said leading into this one, right? It being Thanksgiving. I don't know. That's really funny, too. Yeah, because I, I don't know if everyone out there knows, but Samson was always a Sunday song. You know, Samson Sundays and Saturday night was always on Saturday night. Right. You know, but I would love that. You know, Bobby coming out in his goofy kind of way, it being Sunday. <laughs> then, you know, they dive into it. But yeah, you know, I mean, OK, Terrapin is kind of where it belongs. But dancing in the streets into Terrapin, that's just that little snippet would i'd pay for price of admission alone i, I would too yeah you know and then into a play and but yeah i i, I have never seen I, I this is the first i've ever can recall seeing a shakedown 
uh, come out of the drums or space or, you know, whatever they were doing then. Um, and that's pretty amazing. I, uh, I like that. And then the, you know, the, the play and reprise, which is always nice when they remember to do it. Um, and around and around, I don't know about you, but when I first started seeing them in the early eighties and, and all through the eighties around and around, it was never the closing tune. It was always the tune that would lead into good love and sugar, Magnolia, something like that. But you know, you know, then for a while they, they flipped back and it was the closer. And the thing about that is for me is even if I get a little frustrated with it, I find that if I go back and I look back in their history, I typically find, yeah, they used to do that before. This isn't so strange or whatever. It's just different than what I'm used to seeing. And I love around and around. I think it's a great song um, and it doesn't get enough credit, but you know, I always, I always liked it played into, you know, a traditional set closer. I, I agree. And around and around, because it's a Chuck Berry tune, you know, you always expect it to be kind of a scorcher the way Johnny B. Good or Promise Land is. Yep. And, and it never really takes off. Yep. You know, it always it always feels like it's going to take off, but it never really, you know, has that the same upbeat excitement as the other ones. It's, it's like a down tempo version of a of a Johnny B. Good. Right. Uh, and, and so for that reason, like it's a great song to play before the barn burner at the end. <laughs> But it never really gets it done for uh, for closing a set the way like a Sugar Mags does or the way um, uh, Johnny B. Good would. Right. Yeah. You know, so if you if you think about like you know how you're ending a show, if it's not like you know a, a super Jerry ballad that's you know crushing it down like a Morning Dew, mm-hmm. then uh, then it should be you know an, an up tempo fast you know let's let's close it out with a bang before the encore. Right. And uh, you know around and around I think it was you know late seventies you saw it a lot kind of closing shows. And those are ones that, you know, I was always a little disappointed. That's how they ended the night. Yeah. Now, you know, I mean, I suppose if you're there and the circumstances are right and they really nail it, then, you know, you know, as always, I, you know, my joke with Jim always was that, uh, you know, for us, Little Red Rooster and CC Rider were automatic pisser tunes, right? You know, okay, we'll see you in a yeah. few minutes. But if you ever sat and really listened to him somewhere along the way, you know, Jerry would take over and he'd really start jamming on those songs. And they, you know, they could be a good vehicle, you know, for a couple of really good guitar solos along the way. But it just, it was never a tune that like, you know, got you excited. Um, and, and, and I agree with what you say about Around and Around. And I think that that's a good, a very apt description that it doesn't, it lacks the uh, rocking and rolling of, uh, of of Promised Land or, or, or some of his other tunes. You know, the one that I really like that the Garcia band used to play is um, the one, uh, Say La Vie goes to show you never can tell. Yeah, I agree. And the Garcia band covered that a couple of times, and I I think that's a great tune. Oh, they played it all the time. Yeah, no, it's great, and it's so funny because that's a song that I don't think anyone really, you know, outside of um, you know an earlier generation would have really known too well, but for when Pulp Fiction came out and used that as their dance tune. Exactly. I was just going to say, to me, it was the Pulp Fiction song. Yeah, yeah. And, and when I saw Pulp, I was like, ah, oh, that's great. I mean, I knew Say La Vie from seeing Garcia band shows for for years. And all of a sudden it became like a popular tune among other like people that knew nothing about the dead or, or Garcia band. Whereas I always thought of it, you know, like I, I never knew as a tune, anything other than a Garcia band tune. Right. Right. You know, it, yeah, just a lot of those, but that was great. So, so yeah, so there you go. And of course I suppose, you know, in a certain way, um, you know, those of us, you know, who are the real, you know, true deadheads, uh, not to say that others aren't, but certainly the ones who would, you know, go anywhere, anytime. Um, they saved us a lot of headache and family arguments over the years, <laughs> right? You know, that, that would not have gone over very well in my family year after year. Sorry, kids. I'm not going to be here with you. I'm sorry, mom and dad, I'm not going to be here with you for Thanksgiving. I got to go see the dead again. So, you know, I, I guess they were doing all of us a favor to some degree. Yeah, I think that's right. I can think about how many times I'd fly home uh, from college and uh, get back. My mom be like, great to see you. I'm like, I gotta go. And I just pack up and, and take off wherever the next venue was. And, you know, Never very pleased. Which like, yeah, I would have never bought your plane ticket if I knew you were just going to get home and go on tour. That's so, uh, right. Uh, yeah, I think if I were to do that on Thanksgiving, I probably would have been disowned. Probably. Okay. <laughs> and, and speaking of Thanksgiving and one other topic, and I go to Thanksgiving dinner every year. And for years, it was my parents. And then it was my brother's. And now it's my brother's kids who are all old enough to understand, you know, what I do and that I like Grateful Dead and this and that. And they'll say to me, you know, Uncle Larry, all you do is listen to the Grateful Dead. I like Taylor Swift and I can only listen to her for so long. And then I get tired of it and I don't want to listen anymore or whatever their their music of choices. And it, it you know, my, my typical answer is, oh, I, you know, I just like them. But, you know, it, 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 it's really more than that because and, and, and I, I think it's also almost too easy to say because each song is a little bit different, because even if I have, you know, five different tapes of Shakedown Street or five different CDs with it, I can listen to any of them anytime 
and you know be equally happy and it it's it it was spontaneous i i i i guess what i think is it's trying to say is it still feels spontaneous even though it's not spontaneous yeah i think that's right and look you already touched on it earlier when you, you talked about the dancing going into the terrapin being worth the price of admission you know it's, I, I think of all the different times i've heard both those songs and i can't think of any other time where i can think of a set list where, where it goes dancing terrapin and I, like, I remember like how excited I am to still listen to Cape Cod Coliseum from 79 because of the dancing Franklins, you know, just having like that, that ripping kind of like late seventies disco dancing. Um, so, you know, when you think about the different eras of the dead and you think about the different ways they play it and the different transitions that they do. And, and, you know, you always think, okay, how's, how's this going to be um, interpreted this time? You know, most people that, that don't listen to things very closely might not understand the, um, the nuances, but for those that actually really listen to the music, uh, I, I think that you never get tired of it because it's always something that's fresh. And uh, and that's for me is part of the reason why I can listen to, you know, tape after tape or at this point at this point now, I guess, you know, uh, archive after archive and uh, and just still get excited about what they're doing. Because I'll always find something if it's just background music where I go, ah, let me rewind that for a second and listen to that again. Like I listen to I listen to the the um the jam between the first and the second verse of eyes of the world from three thirty one ninety one i think from greensboro the other day i listened to that jam three times in a row because every time of the playfulness between bruce hornsby and garcia it's just so darn good that i'm like all right i'm gonna you know rewind that and hear that again because you'll never hear that that jam like that again well i i think that's right and it's i mean for me it, it speaks to me on two levels. One is if I understand, you know, and, and like the, the significance of it, I was at the show in the garden in um, uh, September of uh, 83, when they brought back St. Stephen for the first time in five years and they, and they did a breakout. And, you know, I remember yeah. being there in the midst of all of that. And uh, my, my biggest regret is I was still, you know, such a newbie in the whole scene that even though I had already seen him about eight or nine times, it was almost hard to really fully appreciate the moment. So now what I find is when I go back and I pull that up and I listen to it, absolutely appreciating the moment and totally loving the fact that I was there, you know, I, I kind of like get, you know, goosebumps that I, I almost couldn't have gotten the first time around because you didn't know what was about to happen, you know, right. and, and I love kind of reliving that moment over and over. And then the other thing is I, you know, you were, you were talking about that jam between the first and second verse. You know, for me, what I find is the more that I learn about the Grateful Dead, both by reading about them, hearing about them, but also listening to them, that I can go back and listen to a show that I've listened to a hundred times. And with some new information that I picked up along the way, all of a sudden it has a whole new sound to me because now I am focused on the fact that, oh, wow, this was the first time that uh, that Hornsby and Vince were playing together. You know, I hadn't really focused on that before. You know, so you you can it, – it's a constantly evolving seen you know it, it, it it's never the same because you just know more and you experience it differently each time yeah definitely and the song selection can be completely different between eras like you know you and i think of um of let's say uh a shakedown is only a first set opener and sometimes you know rarely a second set opener you, we never think about it as being something that's in the middle of the set the way it was in the 70s because we didn't we didn't see that era whereas you know other songs you know that were only played during certain periods and before I came on today, I actually was looking through, I'm like being the, the Grateful Dead dork that I am. I've got like, you know, all sorts of stats that are still in a three ring binder from the 90s. I still, you know, have carried with me every time I've moved. Sure. And uh, I looked at the stats and I saw the dead play 177 different songs. That's a lot of songs, you know, it's a, a massive amount. And a lot of those were, were songs that they only were playing for the first time in like, you know, the mid to late uh, mid mid 90s. You know, they only played a couple of times before uh, before the dead ended. And then there's a lot that, you know, I saw in the in the late 80s that were getting phased out that you weren't seeing anymore. And it was rare right. that, you know, that I saw songs that they played all the way through, you know, uh, an eight year or nine year period that I saw them. Um, so it's it, it, you always have to think about, you know, what they're doing to reinvent it. You know, if you look at a song like Friend of the Devil, you know, what speed are they playing it at? Is it a fast friend or a slow friend? You know, same thing with an eyes. Is it, is it a fast eyes or a slow eyes? There's completely different tempos they've changed over the years. And I'll tell you, my favorite is they love each other in 1973 they love each other is totally upbeat it's like a whole it, it, it's it, it's a completely different song so much yeah. so that you know it, it, hearing it automatically takes me to that time period and it, it, it's it's just you know it's incredible I, I really really love the way they do it and love the way they play it then but 
you know, look, that it was it was for a brief period, and and he doesn't play it that way anymore. Yeah. They didn't play it that way anymore, and that's okay because yeah. it's just. But it's fun, you know. I can be listening on the radio, and they'll they love each other comes on, and that's that speed up version. I'll turn to my kids and say, oh, that's nineteen seventy three. How did you know that? Yeah. Well, I think 73 has so many nuances like that. The China Rider at Transition Jam is like that, too, yep. where it never has the da, 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 da. It, it, that whole part is uh, is gone in the 73 yep. one. It's just a much more fluid mm-hmm. transition. Yep. And then, you know, obviously the weather report suites from 73, you know, it's, it's so recognizable as soon as you hear the opening notes to um, to the beginning of it. You, you're like, OK, that's a 73 weather report. Well, and, and, and I just as long as you mentioned weather report. I love Bob Weir, and I realize he's always been an integral part of the Grateful Dead. I was always a Jerry guy. Bobby was a great side man to him, and it worked out just well for me. Um, and I and I love seeing Bobby now, but I, I I I don't like the fact that Bobby focuses on Jerry's tunes quite as much as he does because he likes to play them his way. And the, I'm like, would you just fucking play Weather Report, sweet for God's sakes? I, play it. It's such a great song. Why do you feel yeah. compelled to pay all play all this Garcia stuff when you're sitting on some great tunes? play them I, I never understood why they shelved that one of all the things you know of, of all the things to shelve weather report was high on my list of why'd you get rid of it um you know uh you know passenger they eventually brought back but that was another one that, that was one. such a high energy that i'm like why'd you shelve that one for so long and viola lee blues uh, three three paragraph three lines of lyrics and 20 minutes of amazing music i love yeah. viola lee blues supplication too you know like why'd you show supplication yep yeah these were all great so so i guess that's the short answer is because otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here you know week after week talking about the grateful dead and still be just as excited as you know as uh, the first time we've done it yeah no i think once you're uh once you're hooked then there's an endless amount of music to listen to and i think there's one thing that that band did so well was that they encouraged the taping and because of that um uh, you know for the rest of our lives, we'll still never listen to all of it. You know, even if I've heard, even if I get a chance to go through the entire catalog, um, it, there's no way I can like pay attention to all of it without listening to it a second, third, fourth, fifth time. Well, right. So, I, I was going to say, you know, like I, you know, there's always this talk about there. Some you know, people have these hard drives or whatever that supposedly have the entire a terabyte. Yeah, I have it. Oh, so, you know, but it, it, a friend of mine was telling me he has. He's like, don't buy the CDs. I'm like, I buy the CDs because I'm a sucker. I love the packaging. I love the stories. I love all of it. I, I just buy it and I have it. But even with all my CDs, I so. This, at the beginning of this year, I sat down and I organized them chronologically by calendar day to see if I would always have at least one concert per day in my collection to listen to. And I didn't quite, um, you know, but I caught a lot of days and some days I had multiple shows to listen to from over the years, you know, they were all played on the same date. But, you know, it was uh, it was pretty good. I was able and, and I realized how often what is there? Two thousand plus shows. You're right. Even if you sat down and listen, you're, ta- you're talking at least four or five years just to get through the shows. But how do you appreciate them if you don't listen to each show three or four times? Mine, mine for the day is a three nineteen seventy eight Garcia band from the Stanley Theater. Oh, okay. Uh, well, yes, that's a great one. I've been listening very heavily, and I know you uh, mentioned this to me after uh, you were last on our show. Uh, this last Dave's Picks thirty seven, I really, really like that. I, that's been the one in my car that I've been going to, uh, or thirty six, I should say, that I've been going to pretty much nonstop since it came out. As I said, the second the second night first set is one of the most high energy first sets I've ever. You know, it's from top to bottom. That whole show almost. Is a, is a high energy uh, both sets like very very like Tennessee Jed might be the slowest thing on the entire um, on the entire two discs, but it's uh, rare you see them hard charging all the way through like that. Did you ever see them in Hartford? Yeah, I did. I saw I saw the Dead in Hartford in 1990 when they announced them just days before the show. The way that sort of the way the Warlocks was in uh, in Hampton. Oh yeah, yeah. So they didn't announce it until about six days before. I had to drive back and forth from New York up to Hartford because they were only selling tickets in Connecticut. We went every single day once the rumors were hitting that they were going to release them any day. And I drove I think three three mornings in a row at like five in the morning before school to go up and uh, and get those tickets. So I saw I saw those two nights, and I saw a Garcia band play at uh, Hartford Civic Center as well in '89 with Clarence Clemens, mm. uh, which was a nine five eighty nine great night. 
So did did see three shows there. I'll say Hartford was such a cool venue because it was attached to the shopping mall. So it was like where the Hartford Whalers played. Uh-huh. So literally you could like, you know, walk out of like, you know, pay less shoes and <laughs> walk into the venue. I can't think of any other place that was like that. It was just such a strange, um, strange scene. Well, you, that's actually very funny. Uh, you know, and I and I like that because uh, we saw them at um, in Hamilton, Ontario, right outside of Toronto. There's a big amusement park up there. And yeah. literally, you pay to get into the amusement park, and then you pay extra to have a ticket. And when it's time, you walk in like a special, you know, normally you go to Six Flags and they've got the Greg Kin band or somebody playing, you know. But now all of a sudden, it was like the Grateful Dead playing. And you had deadheads on the roller coasters and on the Ferris wheels and then stumbling into this concert. And afterwards, stumbling back out into the amusement park, which had closed by that time. But, you know, try getting the deadheads out of there. The, the only time I saw him there was in, uh, in March of 1992. It was in the middle of a uh, freezing cold snap in Hamilton. So it wasn't a, wasn't that great time to be riding roller coasters. Yep. But, you know, compared to the next year, you know, I, I made reference in our emails earlier today of the 93 spring tour where basically it was blizzarding the entire time from Chicago through, um, through uh, Richfield, Ohio. Yep. And that's, you know, I've only, only went to two shows that were canceled the night of the show. That was one of them in Deer Creek in 95 was the other. But the, uh, the the Cleveland show uh, canceled for what three feet of snow, which turned into probably one of the greatest parties I've ever been to uh, at the Holiday Inn. Yeah, at the Holiday Inn. I was up there, but I've heard stories about that. Legendary. I mean, it's literally like you know, every single person that would have been in the lot, you know, like that would have been setting up shop there, was instead inside this hotel. And the hotel said everyone can come, and we're not going to kick anyone out. And they actually found blankets for everyone and let people sleep in the hallways. But they kept the bar open all night because they knew the cops couldn't get to the hotel. And it was just absolute insanity in that place. It was great. In the spring of 89, I saw the dead in Milwaukee. And uh, same thing, the Bradley Center was basically attached to this multi-level store hotel that had a big, huge atrium in the middle. And all the floors had balconies overlooking the atrium. And we were staying in there. And after the show, there were deadheads filling up. That they had no other place to stay. So they all came in. They were crashing in the hallways. And then, you know, somebody would like start banging on the side and they'd all get, you had this entire, you know, 20 stories of deadheads banging on the side and creating this. It was unlike anything I had ever seen. It was, yeah, we had a good time. And, and, that's, and that's saying a lot because there's a lot of raucous nights in hotels I've had during Dead Tour where, you know, it was a lot of raucous they, they didn't know what hit them. But, uh, but then there's a couple ones that stand out where, you know, the, the stars aligned and all of a sudden 50,000 people would end up at the same hotel. Right. And, uh, exactly. You know, and if you were lucky, the dead might be there too. Exactly. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of 95, I had the tip off somewhere they were staying and ended up in the same hotel as the band for a bunch of those nights. But those actually were a lot more tame because there's a lot of, you know, close friends and road crew and everyone else that would be at those uh, hotels. But other nights where, you know, you're kind of on your own. Um, yeah. I can certainly think of probably a handful of like eight or 10 hotels or, they're in retrospect probably very happy to have seen us go well these sound like fascinating stories which just means we'll have to have you back either as another uh, uh host along with me or with jim or certainly as uh, a guest and we'll get you up into the three timers club there um well, and- that's the thing I'm, I'm looking larry to tell, i want the green jacket you know the way they hand out sorry live after the fifth time so uh, at a certain point you know uh, we're gonna have to talk to dan Dan Humiston about that. He's in charge of wardrobe, so hopefully he'll pull that together for us. And speaking of Dan Humiston, I, I always like to give him credit, but it's even today because uh, uh, when Rob and I get together, we do have a tendency to just keep talking. And I noticed that it's we've gone way past our normal time. And uh, I know that at the beginning, Dan told us uh, that he had some uh, family plans that he wanted to get to. So uh, we're going to do him the favor and we can take our conversation offline. But uh, it's always a pleasure, Rob. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Larry, and have a really lovely Thanksgiving and a safe Thanksgiving with you and your family and Dan, the producer as well. Dan, thanks for having us and you know everyone out there, uh, please have a safe, happy, quiet Thanksgiving this year. Absolutely. So everyone, thank you for listening. We'll look forward to hearing you next week. Uh, Jim Marty should be back with me. Have a great Thanksgiving. Uh, listen to some Grateful Dead and enjoy your cannabis responsibly. Thank you very much. 